Hi. Thank you. I'm going to tell you, it wasn't, it, it was a Tony Award winner that I remember. There was a, there's a great performance as a Sondheim celebration at Carnegie Hall that I watched on PBS. Um, and it was Patti Lapone, Patti Lapone, 100% Patti Lapone. I watched her sing Being Alive and I just thought, this is what I want to do. I, I, I saw her on the red carpet tonight. She was behind me sweating on a red carpet and we were like, and I had a little meltdown because I just thought this is, this is maybe one of my biggest theater idols in the business and there she was and she's nominated tonight and I just, she's one of my biggest idols in the business. Yeah, yeah please. Thank you. Thank you. Oh dear, somebody needs to aim higher. <laughs> Thank you. Hmm. If you want to be in musical theater, get off social media. Like stop living a virtual life and live an actual life. This, this right up here, talking to you, looking at human beings in a room, like don't, don't disappear down your phone and into a, a, a never-ending cycle of neurosis and anxiety, which is all, it's the reason I'm off it completely, just because I was like, why am I anxious all the time? And to be alive, to be a, to be a theater actor in, the, in this business isn't to look at yourself. It's to look outward into an audience and to, to, to find a way to give to an audience. And if you're staring at yourself or cultivating a life on your phone, I would say get out of your phones and get on stage. I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing right now. I'm completely overwhelmed. Um, yes, okay. Of course. Yes, I did. What? You know, the conception of the design has never changed. It has always been the light bulb. And that came from our very first production at Ars Nova when our space was so small, we couldn't even fit real theater lighting in there. And so we had to do the show with light bulbs. And then each time the show got bigger and bigger and bigger, we realized the light bulb really is the heart of the show. It's in the chandeliers and all of Mimi's set research. Uh, it was in all the table lamps. And so the, the DNA of the show has always been the light bulb. Uh, yes. Well, you know, this was the first time we had ever done the show with a mezzanine, which was a totally new thing that we had to deal with, uh, because suddenly the people sitting uh, underneath the mez can't see what's happening in the mez. People sitting in the mez can't figure out what's happening underneath them. So really, we had to develop three separate shows. We had the show on stage, we had the show underneath, and we had the show all the way up top. And somehow we managed to light all three in three days. <laughs> yes. Yep. Was it like that I had a great team. I was in the front orchestra. My associate designer, Nick Salyum, was sitting on stage. My programmer, Jay, was in the balcony. And between the three of us, we would talk on headset. Hey, something's happening up here. We should light it. Oh, hey, something's happening over there. We should light it. And uh, as soon as we got one pass through the show, I just changed my seat every night. I saw the show 40 different times from 40 different seats. Thank you so much, Bradley. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. You know, the thing about Birdie is she's a people person. And she's all about relating to other people and trying to explain herself to them. And so in the same way that audiences warm more to Birdie, an actress will warm more to Birdie, Birdie at first. And Regina is more resilient and independent and self-sufficient and opaque. 
<laughs> she is mean too. Um, but the thing about Regina is she doesn't apologize, she doesn't excuse herself, she doesn't justify, so you have to, she's a woman of few words when it comes to herself, so you really have to explore and figure out what makes her tick because she's not going to try and justify herself to you. Mm. Am I picking or are you, you're picking, great, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. I mean, it's been very excruciating, particularly in the beginning. Um, you know, actors were used to being judged, but it doesn't mean it's fun. And then when there is literally an actor right beside you who you admire and respect so much, who is doing the same part that you're doing, and you think everybody is ready to come and getting, give one a thumbs up and one a thumbs down. It was really excruciating. Luckily, that has not been our experience. Um, but I think it, it's just been a, I don't know, it's been a real wonderful moment of sisterhood and um, kind of ex exploring these characters on our own and sometimes together. Um, and I think also for both of us, it's been a wonderful way to think of this, of this play of these sort of female archetypes, that there is the, the beautiful, sexy, you know, ruthless one, and the and the 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 fragile, timid, broken one, and that we think that these are two very different types of women, but actually, these are two kinds of people that exist easily within the same performer and exist probably inside every woman too at the same time. Yes. The, the, the women's marches all over the country and all over the world, I think, were astonishing. And I think they were uh, astonishing in scope, and they were astonishing in their creativity and their good humor and their numbers. They were astonishing in the fact that it wasn't <clears throat> a political organization that was making them happen, but a woman with an idea in Hawaii. Um, I think the town halls have also been very inspiring um, and the ways in which people on, you know, Republicans and Democrats and independents have said, hey, no, we don't, we don't want that legislation passed. Hey, we don't want, we don't want to lose our health care. We may want it improved, but we don't want to lose it. Uh, and I think that we have seen in things like the ongoing struggle about um, health care, universal health care, and the struggles over things like the, the Muslim ban, that people in droves spoke up really loudly and they called their Congress people and they called their senators and people listened. They made a big impact. The courts certainly were very important, but not more important than people speaking up. Oh. Um, you know, I think that um, the arts are not funded uh, uh, very well in this in this country as compared to compared to other uh, places in the world, um, and I think it's really important uh, to 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 fund the arts on every level as a as a as a means by which a, a civilization is gauged, as a, a means by which you know creating work meaningful work for people and creating revenue and tourism and all sorts of things like that, and but also a way to reflect our society back to us. And I think it's important to fund artists, and not just in New York and California, it's important to fund artists all over the country and to not have that funding tied to um, you know, political points of view. You, you fund people because you think they're good artists, not because they reflect your political viewpoint. Well, I don't know. I, I have one already, and it sits on my piano. So I'll see if they like each other. If they like each other, <laughs> like Laura Linney and I like each other, they can share the same space. If not, you know, I'll have to, I'll have to find another place for this one.
Great. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm sorry that the rock hats are turned off. That's a bummer. Uh, I feel like the bringer of bad news. Um, okay. Hello. All right. Questions. All right. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I think when we all started the show and started talking about these ideas, we were very, um, you know, we, we talked a lot about social media and how everybody's sort of telling us a half version of the truth online and uh, uh, how our uh, people, especially our generation, kind of glom onto tragedy and insert themselves into tragedy. And the more we started working on the show and, and refining the idea, we really fell in love with this character, Evan. Um, and his specific need to belong and um, his need to connect. And so it, it got to a very human place and a very, um, it, it was not such a broad story. It was really a story about this specific person grappling. Yeah. Thanks. In the back there. Thank you. Oh boy, I feel like I'm still aspiring to be me. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's just so crazy to be up here. But um, I know that uh, you know the best advice that I ever got was just to read everything and to see everything and to absorb everything. And uh, when I came to New York, I was told you know take free tickets or cheap tickets to anything off Broadway, off off Broadway, and just soak it all in. And, and that's how you find your voice and and where you belong. And and uh, that was very helpful for me. Last question, right there. Uh, I, I think that, you know, we all feel, or I'll speak for myself, I certainly feel um, like uh, the screens in my life um, definitely force me to feel, you know, isolated and alone often, and um, I think we, it feels like a lot of people feel lonely and alone in their aloneness, um, and, and so it feels like a, it felt like a story that needed to be told about people finding connection even if it's through, um, you know, n uh, people so desperate for connection that they'll even use nefarious means to get it. Um, it just felt like we wanted to talk about that desperation and that hunger. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. I got excited. Okay, questions. Okay, right here. Oh. <laughs> um, well, this was better, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, uh, no, you know what? Um, the last time that we were here, we were really uh, just having a great time getting to meet all of these uh, people and heroes of ours. And um, We stalked Cindy Lauper yeah. for six weeks straight, basically. It was just our ticket to be stalkers, exactly. Um, but th I think this time around, even on the red carpet, we were noticing that we were... Uh, standing there with people that we had begun making theater with when we moved to New York 10 years ago. Um, you know, people that we went to school with in our 20s and we were 18 years old and, and it felt really special to get to be here with what felt like some of our friends and, and that we all had sort of uh, come up and been, gotten to be part of this incredible theater community together. So that felt very, very special. We were BFA musical theater majors at the University of Michigan where you, we had to learn how to spell Frank Lesser and that's what factored our GPA. Yeah. We had to know like, like- Tap dance was part of our GPA. Yeah, or like knowing the seating capacity for the Vivian Beaumont Theater was literally on tests. So this, this is- This is our, this, this is, is sacred is, ground to us and, and nothing compares to it. This is the best feeling in the world. Thank you. We've been so lucky to get to meet a lot of the people that are our heroes and, and they have been, they've played such an instrumental uh, part in our development in, w since we moved to New York City. So those people would include Jeff Marks. We, we worked with him uh, and spent... Uh, we interned for him basically yeah, and, and spent a summer you know, uh, uh, getting his dry cleaning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? but uh, he, he completely changed our lives. He gave, uh, he gave uh, a loan that allowed us to stay in the city and work and write over a summer. And uh, we had to 
would promise that we would pay him back if we ever uh, had a show on, Broadway, a show on Broadway, Broadway before we were 30, and we didn't think that we thought he lost his money, and, and, and then we were able to pay him back. So that was a huge yeah. thing. Steven Schwartz, uh, Aaron's and Flaherty, David, um, David Zippel, Zippel, and John Bacchino. John Bacchino. Yeah, these are writers who we idolized growing up, and then when we moved to New York and started writing, they sort of would sit with us and give us notes, come to our previews uh, of our shows. Steven Schwartz has been to like every preview that we've ever done well, of a show. every single preview. No, every but I mean of every show. And like come and give us, you know, give us notes about how we can improve act one or like, yeah. you know, the really, really great, great notes that, that improve. Generous the... writers who want to pass on this tradition of, of writing musical theater. And so I, know that so it, grateful for that. I know that it's kind of a joke in the show Girls, but she's like, rent is the reason that I moved to New York City. And for me, like, it kind of is. Like <laughs> having, I had a, a ninth grade teacher who had the rent poster on his his wall, and to be like a, a really awkward, lonely gay kid and see rent on my on my uh, English teacher's uh, wall, it was like such a source of inspiration and and possibility of what art can do, and to feel represented in a piece of theater, and um, that really changed my life. So Jonathan Larson, and obviously Stephen Sondheim. I mean, come on. Hey. Writer's block. Well, it's really good that we have each other because um, we are, we fight all the time and we have a very sort of brotherly relationship, but we can kind of push and pull and argue and, and hopefully we can argue our way out of writer's block uh, and push each other yeah, to get out of it. Yeah, because someone's bound to have an idea or at least a very, very terrible first idea and then we'll just build from there. But thankfully, someone's always going to throw something out. Uh, and then um, a Tony, a Tony Memory... Uh, you know, I got to go to a dress rehearsal of the Tonys when I was a kid. I had a teacher that, that took me, and uh, that made it suddenly... The Tonys were something I watched on TV, and that was a world that I couldn't touch or couldn't ever dream of being part of. And then coming to Radio City and watching the dress rehearsal of the Tonys, it made it a little bit more tangible. It was like, oh, they're right there, and those are those actors. They just came from their theaters, and now they're here. And um, it started to think more... It was more accessible, and maybe we could be there someday, too. Right here? What's going on? Oh, this is exciting. Oh, wait, is, this, is it me? Yeah, yeah it's um, a direct play. play. Oh, okay, okay. Right okay. straight ahead. <laughs> Thanks. You know, the future of, of Dear Evan, Evan Hansen? Hansen? It, it, I, they've already. I, <laughs> Yay! Oh, wow. that's awesome! Wow. Wow, bless. That's awesome. Okay. Wow. I, li I wish I was watching you guys watch the show the whole time. <laughs> this is really cool. This is so much better. Um, You're like the informed people who actually like have good opinions. And <laughs> um, wow. They, they already announced a tour, <laughs> um, so we're really excited about that. And who knows? I mean, you know, the, the Tonys, it's such an amazing... Um, it's such an amazing sort of vote of confidence that the community has in this show, and you know we don't know what will happen with it next, but we are are so excited that that we feel like the theater community has embraced the show. So you know we we welcome anything and everything that could happen. Okay, final question over there. Yes, you're also on the Billboard charts. Hey. Uh -huh. and, you know, for kids that can't afford Yeah. 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 I think, well, I'll say for me, um, you know, the show is about how lonely we all can feel. And I think that um, I want, I, I think we want kids to know that that loneliness or that sense of isolation is a temporary thing. And whatever pain you feel, it, it, it you can use it to, 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 to make something that can help yourself and save yourself, and, and you can give that gift to other people, and that's what's so beautiful about theater. Um, you know, and so many shows have done that for us, and to think that this show might have the potential to do that for someone else is, uh, it's, that's the most meaningful thing of all. Yeah, and I think there's not necessarily, um, I don't think that the show always, in every way, necessarily offers a cure for loneliness, but I think there is, a, there is some kind of cure in knowing that we're not alone in our loneliness in a way. And so I think that when people are reaching out on social media or whatever it is, listening to the show, seeing the characters in the show portrayed beautifully by these actors, I think there is some camaraderie in that and that might begin a process of, of healing or feeling connected. So we're, we're just thrilled by that. Yeah. 
And nobody asks about Ben Platt, but he's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay, thank you guys so much. Bye, thank you. Hi, y'all. <laughs> hey, hey, Taking questions. Good to see you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it, it starts with the music for me. And uh, I still remember the first time Justin Paul came over to my apartment to play me songs that he and Benj had written for Dear Evan Hansen. And from the minute I heard Waving Through a Window, from the minute I heard For Forever, from the minute I heard Only Us, I'm like, sign me up. <laughs> and the music, it, it spoke to me, it, it, it drew me. So that really was the first thing that happened. So I knew that I would be involved with the project even before the first reading, before the, 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 I read the script. I just knew that it was something that I needed to, to do. So that's where it starts from for me, because I'm a musician and that's where I live. So that, that's, I'll keep following that. Other questions? Over there? Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's wonderful. It, it never gets old. I, I don't take this for granted in the least. I, I think about all the hours I spend in front of a computer screen, just like trying to make a decision <laughs> about what I'm going to put down on the page, and uh, all the effort that goes into it, all the hours that I don't get to spend with my, with my wife doing it. Um, and uh, I'm just internally grateful. Thank you. Yes. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was talking about the, my professor in, in high school who uh, taught me classical music, and we would spend an hour each week learning the classics, Beethoven, Bach, all that stuff. And then at the end of one particular lesson, he's like, Alex, you should check this out. And he put the vocal selections of Pippin on the, on the stand and said, check this out. And he played me magic to do. He played me Corner of the Sky. And at, at 15 years old, my world is rocking. This is amazing. I love this music. I, I want to hear more. And at the end of another lesson, after, after doing classical music, he's like, Alex, I think you'd like Keith Jarrett. And he played me a record of a man who was improvising an entire concert with the music on the piano. So for him to know that I was fascinated, not just about classical music, but that but I had an ear and a curiosity for other stuff, that completely changed everything for me. Uh, William, Professor William Dawson, just like you think. Yeah. On the far side, right there. Yes. Well, I, I, the music I love to orchestrate the most tends to be pop music. So really, I grew up with, I'm a, I'm a kid of the 80s, so you know, talk to me, Thompson Twins, Cyndi Lauper, Madonna, all that stuff. I've always listened to, without even realizing it, I was listening to how music is made, listening to what the bass is doing, listening to what the drums are doing, and trying to figure out how they're put together. So I know that I, I, I'm most happy when I'm writing that kind of music. So, uh, and I still, listen to that. So I could listen to a song and tell you what the drums are doing without even really paying attention to it. So I try to always be curious. When I go to live concerts, I try to see how music is put together. Like, what are they playing? How are they making that sound? And I try to absorb that, store it away somewhere in my hard drive, in my brain, and, and, uh, and use that for the next show. Great. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, I think he... Yeah, yeah, I would say probably uh, hearing it, the, the band play for the first time. No, actually, you know what it is? It's the Zitz Probe. That's everyone's favorite part because it, you know, you've gotten a chance to rehearse it with the band and the, the chance that the actors get to sing it with the band and hear for the first time what I've been hearing in my head for weeks or months or whatever it is and them actually seeing that it's more than just a piano playing that line or hearing how the, the music expands in that way. So having their reaction, it's usually a big celebratory party, so the Zitz Probe is probably, the, the, that's the one to be. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Cheers. It's hard because you know part of what I what I'm doing on stage is playing a mother who can't be with her kid all the time because she's working too much and trying to better herself and better their lives, and um, so she's missing out on what he's going through, you know, and that's a very real thing. I'm experiencing that right now as an actress. I'm not home a lot for my daughter, 
so I'm analyzing those things a lot, trying to do what I can to soften that. Hi, thank you. Um, complexity um, and uh, something that that um, defies stereotype you know or that that bucks against stereotype you know so so people that can't be easily defined because you know none of us can so everything tends to go a little bit deeper um, over here Rachel Congratulations. thank you Jay Bender. Jay Bender cast me in Meet Me in St. Louis in 1989. Um, I understudied the lead in uh, that big, big musical. When I first came to New York, I'd been here a couple of weeks. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, taking questions. Thank you. In the back here, Christopher. Thank you. I'm glad to. I, I, the the story is is one of so much kindness and generosity and people taking care of strangers uh, at the worst of moments. Um, I, I guess I've been to uh, Gander twice, once to do research uh, and once to do two concert performances of the show. And um, every time I've gained five pounds because everyone feeds you. Uh, and um, the people are great storytellers. And the heart that is is beaming out of that community is, I think, the inspiration for our story. And just what do you think it means for David here? What impact do you think this will have for David? I hope you will ask that same question of David and Irene, our authors. Um, but I am so proud of them. Um, I am so proud of the, the the people in the story, the people of Gander and the Come From Aways. Uh, and I hope that they take the pride that they deserve to take in um, in, in beautiful kindness and generosity. Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. So yeah, we made the decision. We kept cutting down the cast. Um, I think when I first read this, the script, it was maybe 16. And we kept finding that the fewer people who told the story, the more kind of bravura acting um, challenge it was. Um, and um, there's a lot of fun to be had directorially and choreographically. I want to shout out the amazing Kelly Devine, um, choreographer, uh, partner in all that staging. And the fewer people that tell it, the more exciting it is when just 12 chairs turn into all of these locations. The, the dialects were fiendishly difficult. Uh, I, I, I can't speak uh, Newfoundlander dialect to save my life. Uh, but the, um, I think this, the people were always an inspiration to us, the real people, the people of Gander and the Come From Aways. Uh, final question right here. Um, um, uh, if I got one, it would uh, blow my mind. Uh, he's one of, he came to see the show and really spent so much time with the cast and the Newfoundlanders uh, who were there that night. Um, he's a hero of mine. Great. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Person in a state of total shock. Well, forgive me if I don't make sense. I'll do my best. Okay, straight ahead. Yes. Thank you. I mean, first of all, totally, honestly, genuinely in shock and overwhelmed. So that's real. And, um, I think I never dared dream, partly because I was an unlikely candidate for such a thing. Um, you know, it's a very rare moment from what I've seen and in terms of this just straight up numbers. 
And I, I remember with like great, great clarity in 1998 watching the Tony Awards, I think it was 98, uh, when um, Julie Taymor and Gary Hines won, and I suddenly thought, wow, a women can win? I, you know, it cre makes it visible. Um, and I think what is visible suddenly becomes possible. So I hope that this amazing thing that just happened helps encourage, you know, women all over of every color and, and, and um, taste and style and viewpoint to make theater, to tell stories that deeply matter to them. I think that's what we need more than anything to create empathy, actually the greatest number, a percentage of our audience are women. So it's a strange thing such, that such an inequity exists. So, um, you know, I would love to see those numbers shift. Um, and if this is any part of that, then that's even more of a beautiful thing than it already is. Great question, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I feel, honestly, I don't know if you all feel this way, but I feel more and more every day since the election that actually we can relate to this in a very profound way. So I grew up Jewish, and I always thought that, I always judged like Nazi, sorry, Germany in the 30s as, you know, these people that just sort of walked like sheep, you know, they were sort of willing to buy into hatred, no problem. Um, then I met and married and fell madly in love with a German man and learned, you know, just much, much more about that point of view. And now I fear we might, hopefully not, you know, be living something of a similar, we could be. And if we fight it with everything we've all got, then hopefully we won't be. But there's a surge of hatred and, you know, a tremendous resistance of immigrants. So I get of immigration and just a valuing of a kind of rage over valuing of acceptance and love. That, um, so I think for me, I would answer that question by saying that really just doing indecent right now has felt like it echoes these themes in the most profound way that I never, ever, ever would have wished for, ever. Thank you. I mean, come on, like cutting the NEA? It's just so, I don't understand it. I just really genuinely, I don't understand how you can think that arts, well, I guess if you want to kill culture, if you actually want to decimate culture, that's one, you know, a way to do it, and community, and dialogue, and empathy. So that's the danger embedded in cutting what is already a truly, truly endangered <laughs> Um, body, the NEA, you know, I mean, it's beleaguered already. To cut it more just feels like it's, it's, such an, it's such a sort of audacious and ridiculous move, and it says very loudly and clearly, we do not value the making of art, and an oppressive regime, that's exactly what they do, because art creates dialogue and creates meaning, creates conversation. So that's dangerous if you want a, if you are not interested in a democracy. I didn't mean to get so serious. We can have a little fun. <laughs> I really just want to know, if you would go on to that MFA thesis, do you think So, great, thank you for the wonderful question. So 20 years ago, I, I, had, I worked on this version of Indecent that was at the time called The People Versus the God of Vengeance that interwove the play God of Vengeance, which Indecent is about with the text of the obscenity trial. So when, Indecent, when God of Vengeance opened in the 20s in New York, everybody was tossed in jail for obscenity. Um, and it's the story of these two women falling madly in love in a very violent world. 
By the time I called Paula, which was a, dec a full decade later, I was so ready to give over. Um, and I remember Paula, the first thing Paula said to me was, you know, when I had sort of, I had barely gotten the question out on the phone, she said, yes, and it's a bigger story than about that moment in New York. Is that okay? And I said, anything you want. Um, what mattered to me most was to caretake this very, very important memory that I feared was going to be lost. And I had spent three years with the, all the original papers and documents from this moment in time. And, you know, it, was, it had become a total obsession. And I felt that somehow I had to find a way to tell their story that would do their story justice. Paula Vogel was the perfect person. I just couldn't believe she said yes. From then on, I followed her every move with great delight. And she's a tremendous inspiration. Thank you. We are not alone here. We're hoping for some of our <laughs> colleagues to be joining us in just a minute, but we could get started. Our, our director and uh, the widow of August Wilson are coming along, OK? This room looks very serious, <laughs> a, little, a little intimidating. There are All right, questions. Yes. How are you feeling? We're thrilled. <laughs> Jitney is the 10th, as you know, the first play August wrote. Then he put it in a drawer for a little while. Then it came back out. We had the pleasure of co-producing the piano lesson with the great Lloyd Richards and August early on. And then we joined them on seven guitars when Ruben won his Tony. And then we joined them again on King Headley when Viola won her Tony. And somehow or other, Jitney had never made it all the way. And Ruben was determined to get it there. And he talked to Lynn. And I said, yes, and let's do it. We couldn't have been happier than to complete this cycle, as you know, of 10 plays, one for each decade. And finally, August Jitney is on Broadway, and it wins a Tony Award. So bravo. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's a, recently, because it played so much off-Broadway, the Tony, well, you should speak to this. So you're on I'm on that committee, the administration committee of the Tonys some years ago. You guys can fact check what the year was, I don't remember. But they created a sort of contemporary classic situation. So we didn't end up in a world in which an unproduced Shakespeare became the best new play of the year. And so uh, Jitney had run at second stage it transferred to Town Hall downtown, then it went to London, and it's been done around the country, and that sufficiently merited it to be considered a revival, even though it's never played on Broadway before. It used to be, in the, in the old days, it used to be that it would have been considered a new play for Broadway. Um, yes? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We are definitely interested. Um, there was an incredible response to Jitney uh, in New York. And the only reason we had to close it is because, as you know, we're a not-for-profit theater on Broadway. We have a subscription season. And we had to close it in order to open Little Foxes, also nominated for Best Revival. So other than that, the audiences were loving it. And uh, we're in the process of talking about plans to see what future life Jitney can have. In another world, there would have been an empty Broadway theater that it could have moved quickly to. As you know, this is a wonderful, rich, and full season. Every house was booked. So for now, it's over, but stay tuned, I guess. Um, question over here. Will you tell us where you're from? There's so many people here. Where are you from? I'm from Uh-huh. Great. Hi. Are, are you, is that, what is the question? I guess just talking about how you as a, an artistic director, what you, you feel your responsibility is, or how you feel that the Broadway producers do say this is a show that you do for your 
Right, well, this is uh, obviously, um, there are many considerations that go into planning a Broadway season and an off-Broadway season, and diversity is very much at the top of my list, and variety, and all, all, kinds, of, all kinds of criteria, but I completely agree with you. It, it was thrilling to see the kind of diversity that's now more on Broadway as well as off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway. So um, I think that's one of the reasons that Barry says it's been a full and rich season, because it's a season representing New York City and the world. I think that was, Ruben at one point said that um, he had gone, he had talked to 50 different people about doing Jitney on Broadway, and one person said yes, and that was me. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Linda. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Yes, it has. New York critics. Yes, yes. It's been amazing. Yeah. Um, you said that you had to let the show stop because you were paying for another show. Well, we do a subscription season, so we plan every season. If you're a subscriber to Manhattan Theatre Club, you see three Broadway shows, and so we schedule them. And um, so we were we were about to start rehearsal for Little Foxes, and there was not. We couldn't. We extended it so that it had a, a, a longer than intended subscription run, but then we had to go on to the next show. But I don't think you've seen. I don't think you've seen the last of Jitney. Yeah. That's what I was gonna ask you. yeah. Plan, plans are. There's a lot of discussion underway, and I'm sure all of the recognition of this spring will really help move that along a little faster. That's our hope. Thank you all very much. All ten, all ten of the plays that were part of the American Century cycle. He actually wrote more plays than ten plays, but there were ten plays, one for every decade. Right. So now, um, what do you want like, a younger generation of theatergoers to get to know about Broadway? I just think he's one. Of, he is one of the greatest American playwrights, one of the greatest world playwrights, and uh, the more that one sees his work, the more one is transported in the way that um, only the theater can transport you. So I, I'm, sure, I'm sure August Wilson's work will be done and done and done. But we're very, very proud and privileged, as I said, that we produce this show. Hey, everybody. Can I tell you I got married in this room? I got married in this room. It was a, yeah, it was amazing. She, she's still with me. Right over here, Andy. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. You know, I was so nervous, I kind of hardly knew what I was saying up there, but what I really wanted to also say was, my grandfather led the way to my father, which led the way to me, and so many of these vets ha have come home and they didn't know how to move forward. <laughs> but they found a way. And our show is really about moving forward when things feel like they're impossibly broken. And somehow we have an American spirit and, we, and he made that happen. My family made that happen. And then um, we never look back. And when we're young people, sometimes that's the problem, we never look back. And so when we um, have an opportunity to actually see how we got where we are, um, it's really startling and wonderful. Thanks. beautiful and, and it's validating to them you know it's hard when you make a new musical it's it's kind of hard sometimes to know even who you're anchoring it for or who you're pushing it for um, but we knew the emotion was true and we worked so hard to not uh, be heavy-handed with it and to gently um, address the emotional emotional situations that people have fought for for decades um, so it's very moving especially moving for the cast to give so much and then see after the show vets who are crying for the first time, who are saying things to their spouses for the first time after 50, 75 years. Um, and it's, it's an amazing thing to see. Thanks. Thank you. Congratulations. 
you know, since you first, I came from an amazing high school theater program where um, so many of us in this small school in Cincinnati um, became successful people in the theater. So from very early age, high school theater and my theater teachers back then, my dance teachers made a huge difference. Um, I was the only boy in my dance school for my entire childhood. And so my biggest mentors were people I never met. Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly, Jerome Robbins. These are the people that I studied. These are the people that I imitated. I can imitate every one of them. I can imitate Michael Bennett, Bob Fosse. And, and so they were huge idols to me, even though I never had the pleasure of meeting them. Great, thank you Thanks. so much. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. One, one more question. You know, I, I had an injury. Um, I, my, my, bar, my Broadway debut in Guys and Dolls, 1992, with Jerry Zachs, Christopher Chapman, amazing choreographer. And I got hurt. I was out for 18 months. And during that time, I learned so much about how the detail of truth and emotion in your movement is much more important than the height of your leg or the height of your jumps. And so from that moment on, I became a dancer and a choreographer who really worked hard to find the emotional kernel that moved an audience. Um, and I think that's part of the longevity and, and the power of reaching people um, is having choreography that's not at all about dance steps, but having choreography that is about uh, truth. Ladies and gentlemen, Bette Midler. In just a few moments. <laughs> I'm so very, very, very grateful. Unfortunately, I got so rattled during my speech that I forgot to thank the great Bill Prudich, the great Tony Basil, the great Eric Vitro, and the great Mary Eckler for helping me, for actually getting me in shape for this marathon, which it is exactly what it is. It's a marathon. And I also forgot to thank my Yentas, who obliged me to do this job, David Steinberg, Peter Levine, and uh, Alan Grubman, but all of whom told me I could not only that I could do it, that I was capable of doing it, but that I had to do it, and or else they would never speak to me again. So I, I missed them, and I got you know. So I want to make sure that you all know that. Other than that, it was a great evening for Hello Dolly. It was a, it's a, such a beautiful show, and it's so full of um, goodwill and optimism. And I think in these uh, these times, it's. Um, it's very healing. It's a, a healing experience to come to, and uh, I've enjoyed. I've we've been. I've done something like 80 shows or 89 something. 89 shows. I've been. I've done a lot of shows so far, and and it, the audiences are just enthralled with music that they love, that they that they know from their you know from the past, or even if they've never seen a production of it, they know the score inside and out. And the book is so brilliantly constructed, and the gags are so hilarious. I mean, truly, truly, you don't really see shows like this anymore, where there are characters to root for, where there's a romance, where, where, um, um, where the structure, the actual structure, the book is so, it's such a well-oiled machine. And it was a thrill to play because there's not one single word that's out of place in it. It is, it is perfection as far as uh, structure is concerned. And of course, Jerry Herman's songs, which are, will live forever. And um, Gower Champion's choreography, mu much of which was recreated, but much of but there was also a tremendous uh, contribution by Warren Carlyle, who, who filled in the blanks, uh, the places where, they, where we didn't know what J Gower had done or intended. So he sprinkled his stardust all over that production, this production, and Jerry Zachs, his, you know, his inspired comic uh, direction. And the kids, the ki I didn't also forgot to thank, I can't believe it. I also forgot to thank the kids. Which is uh, which? Who are the ladies and gentlemen of the ensemble? The brilliant, brilliant ensemble. Some of the best singers and dancers in the um, on Broadway today. Each and every one of them a complete and utter character. There isn't one normal person in that show, <laughs> and it's so fabulous to see all these uh, these eccentrics on stage. And um, all I can say is that I had the t I'm having the time of my life, just the time of my life. Yes. Sean Spicer here. Yes, what is it? I was curious whether you spoke whatsoever about advice at all. I went to, I got a tremendous amount of advice. I went to Carol Channing, to, I visited Carol Channing in Palm Desert, and she was very helpful. And her son, who had been a child at the time this uh, uh, show started, he had been on the road with her 
as a 10-year-old, and he remembered so much of what went down. And he was very, very helpful. Lovely, lovely man. And um, I also visited with Marge Champion, who was Gower's widow, and she sort of showed me how to get down the stairs without breaking my neck. And she was also very, very helpful. Uh, Jerry Herman, I spoke to on the phone. I didn't, he lives in Florida, he didn't come up. But um, the music is so timeless. Uh, there's these, these songs, you hum them, you sing them, you, you, I don't know, they're like friends, they're like old friends, and people are so enthralled by them. It's really quite remarkable to be in my position because I'm on the stage, and when the lights are, light, light, when the house is lit enough, I can see what they're going through, and it's amazing. It really is amazing. It's, it's, it's a heart, they're so, their hearts are so full. Often they cry, you know, they, they certainly do laugh a whole lot. So I think it's all in all, it's a great, great, it's a roaring success, and I'm very, very proud to be part of it. Yes. Well, he just nagged me to death, and I love him, but I was, I, you know, it's a, a very strong, it's a very, very tough schedule, and I'm a, a woman of a certain age, I'm, you know, at death's door, so I wasn't that keen. <laughs> I wasn't that keen to really, you know, put these old, you know, put these dancing shoes on again, but he made it sound as though it, I had missed something in life and that I would be a changed person from this experience. And indeed, I have been. I lost 30 pounds. Well, that's for starters. And I met all these great people who are so kind and so generous. And, you know, previous to this, you would hear all these mutterings about the Broadway community. And I'm not, I'm a, I'm a loner. I, I don't go much for crowds. So the idea of community was quite foreign to me because when I started, there was no community. There was, which I started in 1965 here in New York. There was no community. There was only, you know, it was every man for himself and sometimes you had drinks. But, uh, Oh, God, later, who knows? Anyway, um, it wasn't the way it is today. There's birthdays celebrated. There's, uh, there's uh, weddings celebrated. There are people be being born, people dying. I mean, it is real life in one theater, all this real life under one roof. And you become a family. And uh, I wasn't prepared for that. I was quite stunned by it. And yet, they embraced me to such a degree that I can only say, it's more than I deserve. So, thank you. Thank you to the Broadway community. Yes? You mentioned at the end of your speech something you meant for you. Yes, I was a, I just a child. I was 14 or so. And uh, Mrs. Myrna Ishimoto, who was my speech teacher, and Mrs. Betty Rice Blake, who was my drama teacher, took me under their wing. And um, we, ha we used to have little contests in our state. Uh, because we didn't speak English in my state. We spoke pidgin English mostly. And they had a program for you to, for, to teach the kids how to speak standard English because we were a territory of the United States. So they would have these statewide contests and they would push me along to do these statewide contests. And I became, the, I was the state champion. <laughs> and I played both parts in Glass Menage. <laughs> it was like sister, mother, sister, mother. And... Uh, Sister, daughter, sister, daughter, and uh, uh, um, uh, that's how I won my trophy, and um, it, they really basically sent me on my way. So I never had a chance to thank them publicly, but uh, 57 years later or so, I, I got my chance. Uh, Mrs. Ishimoto is Myrna, M-Y-R-N-A, that's her first name, and Ishimoto is I-S-H-I-M-O-T-O, -I -I Ishimoto. And Mrs. Betty, B-E-T-T-Y, right? Uh, Betty Blake, that was her maiden name. And she married a gentleman named uh, Commander Rice. Meh, I'm just, I say Mr. Rice. And they, she, I still see Mrs. I still see Mrs. Rice. I don't see Mrs. Ishimoto because I don't go back so often, but gee, they were fabulous to me. They took me to my, Mrs. Ishimoto bought me my first, took me to the first restaurant I, I ever went to. And I, <laughs> You know, I was really, really poor. And she showed me that there was another way, another a way of life, and I, I, it was really marvelous. Yes. Thank you. I think you should watch people. 
I think you should watch everyone, and I think you should watch them closely without judging them. Watch them and see how they behave, because acting is behavior and lying. And um, to, no, to, judge, to, 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 to judge a person stops you actually from um, being able to, uh, to incorporate what it is that they have to offer to a performance. And um, uh, also perseverance. It, 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 it takes a lot. You have to be very strong-minded. You can't be a drunk. You can't be a druggie. I mean, you people can be druggies, but they, have, they, come, they, they fall on hard times. So it takes tremendous discipline. And especially in the theater, as I have discovered, you live like a monk. I mean, you do nothing, okay, nothing. You warm up and you do your show, you go home and you, and the last night of the week you get a drink. Oh, hallelujah, <laughs> big deal. You know, maybe you'll get two, but then you'll be sick tomorrow. Anyway, it's very, it's a hard life, and yet these people have been, are, when I met these people, I've never seen such dedication, and I've never seen such um, willingness to put themselves through such stress, because it's terribly stressful. The, the, um, the rehearsal process is very stressful, and, you know, if it's not right, they make you do it many, many times, and people get injured, and, and yet they continue because it's in their blood, and they love it so. And I, you know, I'm, a, I'm the laziest gal in town. I like, you know, I, when I go on the road, I do sh two shows, and, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, my God, I did two shows. And these people do eight a week, and I sometimes liken it to Christmas week at Radio City. <laughs> where I was like, oh, my God, i got to go to do another show. So, um... I must say it has been life-changing and it's been life-affirming because uh, what it has, what the show itself offers, this democracy, this optimism, this color, this, and you know, the color, I have to say something about the colors because Sandra LaQuasto did the sets and costumes and they're absolutely exquisite. And the man who built them, uh, he, uh, there were two people, there was a, someone in Toronto, but a Werner from Euroco, I know, and he is, ab he is one of the greatest craftsmen I've ever met in my life. And in the theater, there are all these craftspeople that you don't know about. There are shoemakers, there are prop makers, there are builders. The stage, the Broadway stage uh, supports 86,000 jobs. So the arts are, at, are, the arts are a source of revenue for the city and a great source of revenue for the United States if only they weren't so narrow-minded and, and uh, perverse about uh, helping with the NEA and helping people, you know, hel helping, the, helping the arts out in our, in our world. We are, they are dead set on making barbarians out of all of us and all of our children. I don't want to be a barbarian. I want to have color and beauty and light in my life. And I think everybody in their heart of hearts does. So, eh, that's where I stand. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Ben Midler for president. How are you? Heavens. Thank you so much. I think it, it's the sort of thing that, that used to be common or, or, or is less common, so that's why, why I was so drawn to it and I thought it was so precious, was they just thought, well, someone should do this, so why not us? The scene in the play where Mona describes being in the Palestinian territories and watching an Israeli, really a boy with a uniform and a gun, and a Palestinian boy in jeans and rocks facing off terrified and seeing their look exactly the same. That, that was sort of the origin story in the play because that's, they both and other people who are there have all said the same thing, that they experienced that. And then in a way that seems sort of kind of heroic to me, they decided, well, we have to try to do something. And it was a crazy scheme they concocted and it was quite remarkable. Yes. Uh, I'm going to have a very cold gin martini. Yeah. <laughs> Plural. Oh, wonderful. Other questions? Yes. To Andy. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, the, we are in the midst of doing the London casting right now, and so if you ask me that in a week, I'd have a clearer sense for you, just because it's, as you saw the play, I mean, votes not to be presumptuous, if you've seen the play, it's a massive uh, cast and requires a sort of jigsaw, so we're literally in the middle of doing it. And uh, for the film, one of the reasons I wanted to work with Mark Platt is because Mark and I share the same belief, which is you write this, the movie, then you figure out the casting, not the other way around. Um, so I, in six months, I'll have that answer for you, too. Okay. Wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you all Thank very you so much. Andre Bishop. Here? Okay. Okay. Yep. Great. All right. Taking questions. So, what am I supposed to do? Oh, horrible. I'm really so depressed. It feels, it feels wonderful. You know, it's a great play and it was recognized and one feels happiness and I'm sure as millions of other people have said to you, one feels relief. So, in equal measure, happiness and relief, I think. Does, do, do my glasses look... I sat on them or someone sat on them during the performance and my date had band-aids in her back. So, this is why I look so weird. And someone said, oh, it's a fashion statement. <laughs> well, uh, we're in the Little Mitzi Newhouse Theater. We're doing a new play by, by Dominique Morisseau called Pipeline, which goes into previews on Thursday. Uh, we're doing a piece by this immersive theater group called The Third Rail, which is in previews now at LCT3. And then later in the summer, we go into rehearsal for a new play by Ad Akhtar, whose play Disgraced we did a few years ago called Junk, about Wall Street and junk bonds in the 1980s. And then My Fair Lady. Not a new piece, but. No. Um, and Andre, over here, please. Yes. Well, I'm sorry, what? Why did we transfer it? Mm -hmm. Well, I thought it was a good fit because I feel the play is extremely timely and important. We had a huge success with it in the Mitzi Newhouse Smaller Theater. Uh, the actors wanted to go on with it, and I thought because it's a rather presentational play and a play of language and kind of epic that it suits the Beaumont stage, which is not suitable for every play, but I thought that Oslo would actually be better in a bigger house, and I think it is. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben Platt. Hello. Hi. All right, questions. Right back there. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I would really hope that they know that they uh, are not unique in their loneliness and that everybody is at some point in the same spot and also maybe not to be so hard on themselves and to know that everybody reaches a time when they can't be completely satisfied with the person they see in the mirror and that that's something that can pass and that can be improved upon and that there are people who are going to see the redeeming parts of you and that you're going to find them in yourself. Um, certainly. I mean, I think no, there's no human being that can say that they haven't at some point second-guessed who they are and I think, you know, growing up somebody that was not a big sports player and like to go do shows in the backyard. It's something that you think about, and, but I'm, I'm very happy to say that I, I love who I am. Okay, great. great. Right here, Chip. Congratulations. Hi again. Hi, so well earned. Um, Thank you. You've been with the show for such a long time. I'm wondering if there are people who you'd be willing to do a role again in other incarnations of the show where it's like, 
I really have no idea. I can't really see beyond this current moment at the moment. <laughs> I'm still trying to fathom it, but I love the show very much, really. Thank you. Great. And Ben, right over there. Hello. Um, congratulations. Thank you. Well, thanks. Um, and I, I think it's pretty clear that it's not going anywhere. Sure. Uh, what advice do you have for any other actors that might be this role? That's a really good question. Um, I would say really trust the material. It's really beautifully written material, and I think that something that's easy to do is get afraid of the difficult actions that Evan takes and sort of try to overplay the anxiety, the likability, the nervousness, just sort of a little bit of... Um, uh, of a defensiveness because of what he does. Um, but I think if you play the intentions and play it beat to beat and really trust the writing, then the audience will sort of come to you in a, in a nice way. I guess that's my biggest thing. And also just really take it one show at a time. And Ben, all the way in the back room there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hardly remember what I said. <laughs> I hope it was good. <laughs> that's high praise. Sure. I had some fragments in my head, some from when I was a kid, some from <laughs> when this nomination happened, some from all along the way. I d didn't really believe in like writing it down. That felt very jinxy to me, and I, I just made me feel strange to do that. But I had a, um, some piecemeal pieces, and then I, th I think I hoped that what was very important would come out, and hopefully it did. I will find out later when I watch.